Bardzo mola. We ready? Okay. Oh, good morning. It is so good to see you here. It is so good to be here. And, and so wonderful that we can rejoice together in the greatest truth the world has ever known. I was preaching on an Easter Sunday, and after the service, a man came up to me and asked if he could talk to me for a minute. He was a first-time visitor in the church I was preaching at, and he told me that he worked in a hardware store near there, and the day before, the pastor of that church had been in the hardware store and had given him a gospel tract. It was the day before Easter. He said that he'd come to church on Easter because he felt like not going to church on Easter was a really bad thing and that he was already in so much trouble with God he didn't want to be in any more trouble. He said here was his problem. He said he was in legal trouble. He was about to go to trial and was going to be prosecuted for a crime he had committed and was guilty of and that you know there's no way he's not going to be found guilty. And that um, he was in terrible financial trouble because of all the things involved in being arrested and tried and prosecuted. So his finances were a disaster. He was going to have to declare bankruptcy and lose everything. Said his wife was divorcing him over all this trouble that he was in. And said he, he thought he really wanted to know God, but he thought before he could know the Lord, he had to get his legal trouble taken care of. He had to get his financial trouble taken care of. And he had to work things out with his wife. But then he said, if what you said was true, talking about the sermon I just preached, he said, if what you said is true, he said, I could get right with God this morning. He said, man, have I got good news for you. You got exactly the right thing from the message. You don't solve these problems about your relationship with God. Jesus Christ solved them when he died on the cross for you. He trusted Christ as a savior that morning. Well, we were talking about imputation. Christ's righteousness applied to our account. And we're going to continue with that. We had just finished um, a couple things on that. We're about to get to biblical examples of imputation. Then you have Abraham. And you look at these three different places that refer to why Abraham was counted as righteous. Abraham, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. So why is Abraham saved? He believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness that he believed God. Then James, that so many people confuse, and we will talk to, about that probably on the, tomorrow morning, says, but it says even in James, a passage people confuse, it says, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Why was Abraham counted as righteous? Because of some great things that he did? Because he believed he was counted as righteous. And then in Romans, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham, read Hebrews. Great hero of the faith. Considered a great Hebrew by the Jewish people, a great hero by the Hebrew people. Certainly Christians consider him great Hebrews. We think of ourselves as sons of Abraham. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But why was Abraham counted as righteous? Because he believed God. Okay. David. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man who, um, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's Romans 4, 6 through 8. 
uh, quoting uh, Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and whose spirit there is no guile. God led, Holy Spirit wrote those words through David after David's great sin. So why in the world is David counted as righteous? It's not because he always did the right thing. I mean, he was a man after God's own heart. There were some times what he did was tremendous. But boy, when you come to the story of Bathsheba and Uriah, you cannot make bigger mistakes than what David made. So why was he counted as righteous? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. And I know folks are trying to say, but you start telling people that, you start telling people they can be saved and, and they sin and they're still saved. So they're just going to go off wild and, and live in sin like crazy. Well, you finish the story. Things didn't go real smooth for David here on this earth. There's price tag for your sin here on this earth. But glory to God, this is when people begin to live in dedication to the Lord when it gets to them what God has done for them. So if I'm counting on how good I do, sooner or later I'm going to get discouraged and give up. Because I'm going to be moments when I didn't do as good as I should. But how many moments are there going to be when the Lord has failed me? The answer is absolutely none. J. Dwight Pentecost writes about the story of Onesimus from Book of Philemon. Paul's prison cell in Rome became a pulpit from which the gospel went out to multitudes in the capital city of the Roman Empire. Among those to whom the gospel came in transforming power was a runaway slave, Onesimus, who had stolen from his master, made his way from the city of Colossae in Asia Minor over to Rome. While Paul could have used this newfound son in the faith to minister to his needs as a prisoner, he purposed to send Onesimus back to Philemon, his master. Paul wrote the letter to Philemon to exhort him to forgive and to restore his runaway slave to count him as a brother in Christ. Paul recognized that before such a restoration could be made, the debt which Onesimus had incurred must be paid. Onesimus is a runaway slave. Okay. He stole and ran away from his master. Now he's gotten saved under the ministry of Paul. Paul sends him back to Philemon and he know, and tells, asks Philemon to receive him. And he knows there's the issue of the debt. Onesimus had nothing with which he could discharge the debt. And so in penning his epistle, the apostle says, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or owed thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Paul said, I will be responsible for the debt he owes you put it on my account, I will pay you. Man, aren't you glad the Lord Jesus Christ did that with us? I don't know what, how much Onesimus stole, but it was a repayable amount. What I owe God's not repayable. Not by me. Not repayable by anybody else in the history of the universe except for one. And he said to put it on his account. Those words the apostle has given us a classic example of the great Christian doctrine of imputation. Stephen. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God saying, Lord Jesus receive my spirit. And he nailed down and cried with a loud voice, Lord lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen's praying for the people that are killing him. He's saying, don't put this sin on their account. That's imputation. We had said this, he fell asleep. Paul, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God it may not be laid to their charge. I mean, there were Christian brothers who stood, should have stood with Paul, and they did not 
when the world came after him. And Paul is saying, Lord, don't hold that to their account. That's imputation. Great song, My Hope is Built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. I mean, this is very much the point. I don't care what you are trusting for your salvation. If it is not Jesus' blood and righteousness, you are in trouble. I don't care whether you're a Catholic or a Baptist. I don't care whether you lead a reasonably clean life or, or live in the obvious dregs of sin. If you're trusting anything besides Jesus' blood and righteousness, it's hopeless. The only one who can save you is Jesus. And that is not because you repented of your sins, not because you reformed. That is not because you got baptized. It's not because you gave up a particular sin. It is not because you started doing some particular good thing. It is because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. When darkness veils his loving face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath his covenant, his blood, supports me in the overwhelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. I am going to stand before the throne of God one day, faultless. You want to know why? Because there's no record of my sin in heaven. By the way, uh, tomorrow, when we have f four hours tomorrow, the last hour is normally reserved for some special things in the class. The third hour, we will devote to trying to answer any questions that you would like to ask. So if you wanted to write those questions out today and give those to me today, I will do my very best to answer them the third hour tomorrow. Okay. Next study. Man, what a beautiful one. Salvation seen as propitiation. Boy, that word propitiation throws people because we don't use that word very much. There's not very much in which we can use it. In fact, a lot of critics of the King James Bible say that word shouldn't be there. They say people can't understand it. We should replace it with something else. But anything you replace it with is not going to be as complete as this beautiful word propitiation. J.F. Strombeck from his book, So Great a Salvation, on propitiation. Salvation is a work of God on behalf of men. But in order that he might do his work, he had also to do something on behalf of himself. God in love longed to save man from the consequences of Adam's sin. He longed to save man from the consequences of Adam's sin. Even as soon as Adam sinned, God came in the cool of the evening and called Adam and said, Where art thou? God's loving heart has ever gone out to save fallen man. If you're aware of this important fact. But he who is love is also infinitely righteous. He who is love is also infinitely righteous. He's also unchangeable. God's infinite and unchangeable righteousness and justice demanded that the penalty of his law, which the creature, penalty of his law, which the creature, man had broken, must be imposed and the execution of it carried out. God's infinite justice therefore limited his own love. If God was to save man, he had to do something on behalf of himself so that he could remove the consequences of sin without compromising justice. And God's, did lo God's love 
uh, did find a way by which the limitation by justice would be met and removed. Here in his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4.10, 1 John 2.2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. To understand the meaning of this verse, it's necessary to understand the meaning of the word propitiation. It is that which appeases or satisfies the divine justice. Appeases or satisfies the divine justice. And conciliates or wins over the divine favor. It means to remove that which causes the problem. There's just not any way we can use it in everyday language. People say we have to have a Bible that uses everyday words. There is no everyday word for this truth. And some people say, well, let's, let's say covering. It's a covering. And that's usually what we say to explain it, but it's more than a covering. I pastored in Chicago in an old church building. And um, right in front of the pulpit, on the carpet, was a huge, horrible stain. And um, there was a rug just big enough to cover the stain that was there that covered that stain. And, and the rug looked silly in the auditorium like that. But the stain looked worse. So I made up my mind, I'm going to get rid of that stain. We tried every type of stain removal you could possibly think of to get rid of the stain. We tried stuff you could buy at the store, and the stain would go away and come back. We tried three different professional stain-removing companies who came in to remove it. They told me, said, if you'd really get down and look close, you can see it's still there. And it came back, and came back, and came back. So even though I hated that rug, I had to leave the rug there because I could cover the stain, but I couldn't remove it. You know what propitiation is? Propitiation has power over space, time, and history. Propitiation removes the stain. It doesn't cover it up. It removes it so that it never was. Now you tell me how you explain that in normal everyday language. But don't take that away, don't try to take that truth away from me with just the word covering. God has not just covered my sin. My record in heaven is that I have never sinned. He is a propitiation for my sins. And not mine only. No matter who I would witness to. I have this knowledge. Jesus Christ has already died. And paid the penalty for that person's sin. Well, propitiation is too hard a word. No, it's a Bible truth. And it's sure worth learning for anybody. Well, the meaning of the above verses is the love expressed is expressed in that God sent his son to satisfy his own justice, to make it possible for him to extend favor to man. This expression of love is not only for those who are saved, but for all mankind. It's well to be here reminded of that which constituted the demand of God's justice and how Jesus Christ satisfied the demand. God's justice demanded death because of the transgression of his law. The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God's love could not remit that penalty. He could not set it aside. God's holy and righteous law must be upheld. His wrath against the unrighteousness of man must take its course. When a son of man was sent, he came into the world as a man. He lived here 33 years as a man, and every detail of his life, he satisfied all that God's justice demanded. And he voluntarily went to the cross. He, the creator of man, was by, the, was by wicked men nailed to the cross. Their sin is rebellion against God, which is climax. 
And then as he hung on the cross, God laid upon him the sins of the whole human race. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Laid upon him the sins of the whole human race. The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That included the first sin by Adam. It also included every sin of every one of the seed of Adam, born up in that time, and even more. The sins of all men yet to be born. The sins of all were laid upon him. Then God's judgment upon sin fell upon him. And Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, wast thou forsaken me? When he had cried up again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Here is death because of the sins of mankind. It was a double death, spiritual death, because in being forsaken by God, he was separated from him. Spiritual death, because we're separated from God. Physical death and yielding up the ghost. And that is exactly the curse rested upon man because of sin. Because he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, with his stripes we are healed. How was my sin problem dealt with? And the answer, through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a statement in the Bible that clearly states that God's purpose in sending his son was on his own behalf. It was that he might remain just and save the sinner. God was consistent with his own nature. The plan of salvation that God devised was the only one consistent with his own nature. It does not excuse sin. God's justice demanded that sin be paid for. God's holiness would not allow him to accept our sin. But in the death of Christ on the cross, his justice was fulfilled and my sin was paid for. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross, God's holiness was fulfilled. My, the stain of my sin was removed. God's love was fulfilled because salvation could be offered to all men. And God's grace was fulfilled because a free gift became available to every human being. God's plan of salvation, as, as different as it may seem from all religions of the world, God's plan of salvation satisfies and fulfills the holy nature of God. It makes our salvation possible without God violating his nature. That's propitiation. Dr. C.I. Schofield, in his note on Romans 3.25, calls attention to the fact I'm sorry, I need to go back a little bit. He might remain just, save the sinner. It is found in Paul's great treatise on justification by faith. He there declares that God set forth Christ as a propitiation that God might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in him. According to this, God could not remain just and justify any sinner apart from the fact the demands of his justice were met by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. You see, I. Schofield, his note on Romans 3.25 calls attention to the fact that the Greek word, which is there translated propitiation, is also used in Hebrews 9.5, where it's translated mercy seat. That is where we go as the mercy seat to find forgiveness from the Lord. The cross then, where propitiation was made, because judgment was passed upon sin, became the place where God shows mercy. This is the essential meaning of the cross of Christ. He will come to the cross as the place where his own sins have been judged in the person of Christ, will receive mercy at the hand of God. Because of the cross, grace becomes sovereign and reigns into eternal life. Throughout the ages of human existence, man has realized there's a wrath of God that needs to be appeased before a man can come unto him. 
but relatively few, indeed very few, knew that God himself has provided a propitiation. After Adam had sinned, he hid because he said, I was afraid. Ever since then, there's been in the heart of man a fear to meet God because of his supposed wrath towards sin. Mythology is filled with the stories of men trying to appease the God, their gods. So also the heathen go to great excess trying to appease their gods. And the feeling that something is demanded of man to satisfy the vengeance of God is far from lacking even in so-called Christian lands. Every thought of man that something can be done in heaven his, to lessen his punishment in the hereafter is a confession that he feels the wrath of God needs to be appeased and that God is not favorably inclined in him. I mean, all these religious ceremonies of all kinds of religions, all kinds of programs, ideas, all, all the idea, we've got to do something. We've got to find something. Every religion, apart from Bible Christianity, is built around offering men something they can do to satisfy the wrath of God. Disagree with what you do. But every religion is built around this. Is, this is, we can tell you what to do. This is what you can do to satisfy the wrath of God. And none of it works. The central truth of the gospel, the good news of the grace of God, and that, that which is so little understood, the wrath of God against all righteousness of men, has been appeased in the death of his own son been appeased in the death of his own son. His justice has been satisfied. Been appeased in the death of his son. His justice has been satisfied. And now God in love is longing to extend pardon and peace to all who will come to him by the way of the cross. Lewis Perry Schaefer on propitiation from his book Salvation. The meaning of this word is inexpressibly sweet. It refers to divinely provided place of meeting, a place of propitiation. The mercy seat of the Old Testament is spoken of in Hebrews 9 5 as a place of propitiation. There, covering the broken law, was the blood-sprinkled mercy seat. And there was the Shekinah light which spoke of the presence of God. There too, because of the blood and what it typified, a holy God could meet a sinful man without judgment. And in turn, a sinful man could meet a holy God without dread or fear. So we find in Romans 3, 25 and 26, that Christ was set forth by his Father God to be a propitiation through faith in his blood so also in 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. On the, not for ours only. On the cross has become the divinely provided place of meeting. Divinely provided place of meeting. Where now a guilty sinner can come to God without fear. And the righteous God can receive that soul apart from all judgments and condemnation. The propitiation, the mercy seat, is where I can meet the Lord. This is not a geographic location. But I can go to the Lord and I can say that to anyone with whom I have conversation, that they can go to the Lord and have the Lord trust the Lord as their Savior because Jesus Christ has been the propitiation for their sin. No matter what culture they're in, doesn't matter what their past has been, if they're old enough to understand the concept of a gift, you can understand salvation because that's exactly what salvation is. It is a gift that God gives to us, to those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Say, so, well, the word propitiation is a word might scare some lost people. 
then don't share it with them until after they get saved. But don't try to take it away from us. That's a, such a glorious truth. Try the word gift. And pretty much everybody gets that really good. Yeah. In like manner, every soul has been as freely justified who's believed. It's a question of intelligently electing to receive and stand in the saving work of Christ, which is simply to receive the Christ as a personal savior. The sinner thus acknowledges Christ as divinely appointed propitiation, and therein in confidence rests his case before the righteous throne of God. From these three Bible words, we may conclude there's a work now fully accomplished in the cross for every unsaved person. Such have been thoroughly changed in their relationship to God by his great act of reconciliation. And he is said to be waiting for them to be thoroughly changed by the message of the cross in reconciliation toward him. He has redeemed them by the blood of Christ who is the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of all the world. But he's now waiting their act of faith toward Christ that he might, with the power of the Spirit, transform them into the very sons of God. He has been propitiated toward the whole world. But what must await the willingness of the individual to stand only on the fact that righteous judgment for sin had already been accomplished in the cross of Christ? The cross was a propitiation toward God. A propitiation toward God. You notice the paragraph begins when he says these three words. He's looking forward to these three words we're about to use. That cross was a propitiation toward God. A reconciliation toward man. Propitiation toward God, a reconciliation toward man, and a redemption toward sin. Propitiation toward God, a reconciliation toward man, and a redemption toward sin. My sin has been paid for. I have been offered reconciliation with God. And the offense that separates me from God has been removed. Wonder if I have any reason to serve him after all that. And this is relation to every member of the fallen human race. If men go to perdition, it will be because every possible mercy from God has been resisted. God gave us this message and who did he tell us to take this message to? whole world folks debated that whether it needed to go to the whole world I, I'm in an interesting project I've just got started thinking about it was asked to do it a preacher friend from Singapore is writing a book about the Baptist Bible Fellowship statement of faith back in the 1970s it may not may seem a strange thing that that group had a different statement of faith in the 70s than they do today but they put out a statement of faith in the 1970s that motivated one of the greatest mission movements in the history of the world. In that time frame, the 50s through 60s, 70s, they were reflecting it, what they put out in the 70s. Baptist Bible Fellowship missionaries went all over the world taking the gospel places where it wasn't being preached. Philippines is a prime example. Uh, you, you go back to 1949, before Baptist Bible Fellowship started sending missionaries here, there was not an independent Baptist church in all the Philippines. Now, there are thousands. What they accomplished in that time frame is amazing. But it wasn't just here. Korea, many African countries, Russia, Japan, I mean, it's just all over the world. You see during that 30-year period, Baptist Bible Fellowship missionaries went 
places that the gospel was not being preached, where there weren't churches, and there was a lot of controversy. People said, you don't need to go there. You shouldn't go there. The people don't want you. They won't listen to you. They haven't been predestined. They, you, you don't, we don't belong there. But in the doctrinal statement of the Baptist Bible Fellowship, they said it was clear that the salvation message was for all men, and the mission was that we take it to all men. And, and so a fellow has written a book from Singapore. He's asked me to do the foreword. He's written a book on um, how this doctrinal position, he says, it's just not theory. This motivated one of the greatest mission movements in the history of the world. And you see the results of it all over the place. And um, missionaries to China started churches that were officially shut down when the communists took over, and yet the remnants of those churches still exist. I mean, it, it was an incredible missions movement. I'd like to tell you the Baptist Bible Fellowship is still like that today. It's not very much, to be honest. But that emphasis on that doctrinal statement sparked a movement that has no doubt led to millions of people being saved, including many in the Philippines. And this brother's from Singapore. He knows about it from the impact of this movement leading to missionaries going to Singapore and starting Bible-believing Baptist churches in Singapore. But his point is, I, I haven't finished looking at the book. I got to looking at it last night. He just sent it to me, asked if I'd write the foreword which I'm, I'm honored to do. And, uh, but, but his whole point was, doctrine has consequences. Do you know why these missionaries went all over the world taking the gospel to Japan and China and the Philippines and all these different African countries and Korea? And you know why they did this? Because they honestly faced, this is what the Bible said. Who is this gospel for? And if this gospel was for everybody, what right did we have to keep it in America? And the answer is none. Okay. This concept matters. Who has Christ been the propitiation for? The sins of the whole world. Which, by the way, and it's one of the things that, that I've been excited to watch. I've been coming here for a quarter century now, a little over that. And, and I have watched so much emphasis grow among the Filipino churches on sending out Filipino missionaries. I hope that's what some of you are training for. I mean, it's an incredible thing to watch. It is that same truth. And it is the proper response to that same truth. That you would send out missionaries to the whole world. Why? Would Christ be the propitiation for the sins of the whole world if he did not want us to tell the whole world? And he certainly has told us to tell the whole world. So here we are, and that's what we have to do. Well, a propitiation toward God, a reconciliation toward man, and a redemption toward sin. And this is relation to every member of the fallen human race. Men go to perdition, be because every possible mercy from God has been resisted. Okay. Harold Wilmington on propitiation. Let's stop, take a break right there. We'll come back in 10 minutes. <laughs>